For many faithful, this year's Easter, Passover, and Ramadan will be completely different as an experience now that large gatherings are prohibited. And since shelter-in-place guidelines went into effect last month, many religious groups have shifted services and meetings online. But larger questions remain about how to serve congregants' spiritual needs during a time of crisis, how to carry out charitable works, and how to maintain operations long-term. In some cases, religious leaders are defying shelter-in-place guidelines and argue that their services are essential. And in this hour, we're going to talk with religious leaders about how they're adapting to the coronavirus pandemic. Good morning to Imam Rami Ansur, who is the founding director of the Tabia Foundation. Welcome, Imam Ansur. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me and having me on the show. Glad to have you with us as well. And let me begin, if I may, with you. And let's just uh, find out in a general way what you're doing, because uh, as I said, there are many, most of them outside of California, who say fellowship and meeting in community is absolutely essential, and therefore we're going to defy these orders to be sheltered in place. Um, I want to know where you stand on that, but also if you're standing and sheltering in place, what you're doing about the fact that you can't bring your congregation together. Yes. Uh, so when this all began um, back in, or more people were, were paying attention to it, at least, there was a lot of communication within the, the Muslim community on what to do. And even before the shelter in place went into effect, a lot of mosques in the Bay Area and around the nation, they actually stopped their Friday prayers. So the Friday on uh, right before the shelter in place, that it had stopped. And a lot of Muslims reached into our tradition and our scriptures and um, they were referring to a prophetic saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that if there is a, an outbreak in a land, then don't go to that land. And if you're in that land, then, then, then don't leave it. So the idea of quarantine. So we have this within our tradition, the idea of quarantine, and another tradition that says that if there is an outbreak or a pandemic, uh, that the person who stays in their house and waits it out gets the reward of a, uh, gets, gets a great reward. So um, a lot of Muslims just automatically went into this mode and uh, transferred their worship to um, to worshiping at home. Um, and the idea that that it's an essential service, uh, well, the, the the other aspect of our faith, and and we share this with many other faiths, is do no harm. Um, that we don't. One of the foundational uh, teachings is that we cannot harm others. And so if there is anything that we do that would bring harm to another person, even as basic as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if you ate something like garlic and you still have bad breath, then you cannot go to the mosque. So the scholars were reminding Muslims around the world that if something as simple as bad breath would prevent you from going to the mosque to harm or offend others, then what about possibly uh, causing somebody to get, to, you know, the transfer of this flu? So you've got your holy books to back you up in this quarantine, and that's good, but you're not able to meet in fellowship. And I know, particularly as Ramadan is coming up and so forth, that it is really crucial to have people meeting together. That's really the way things have always been done, hasn't it? It has, and uh, the, the Friday prayers was actually the first biggest shock uh, that a lot of people had, uh, because for many people, especially here in the Bay Area with the our fast-paced lifestyles and the commutes and the hustle and bustle of just daily life, the, um, the Friday prayer is a reprieve, and for many it's their way to recharge and reconnect with their faith. So that was an initial shock, and then having to deal with that. And then when the Muslims saw our, our holy sites, such as Mecca and Medina, also shutting down, and there's pictures on the Internet of the Kaaba, which is usually full and teeming with people, and it's just empty. That was another shock. And then the uh, the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, when it was closed down, it was it was yet another shock. Um, so so people are then trying to look into our tradition and say, okay, how, what do we do? And so one of the 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 recourses is, okay, let's turn our houses into our places of worship. And uh, one of the ideas is that we should turn our make our houses into monasteries. And there's one of the an early uh, Muslim saying of this nature that. Uh, that how wonderful is the house of a uh, how wonderful is the monastery of a believer his or her house so the idea is turning our our worship inwards and for the ramadan even though it's um it's it's a, it's it's the common practice to pray in congregations in the mosques and you'll see this all over the world there's also another tradition of praying the nightly prayers at home either by yourself or also with with your family so people are turning in making their congregations really their families turning in um there's even some there's pictures of of people uh giving sermons you know within their homes 
and, um, and, and really turning their houses into monasteries. So that's one of the, the silver linings that we can see in this cloud. Well, it's good there are silver linings, but closed mosques and uh, no Friday prayers uh, in terms of fellowship. It's all very disrupting. Education has changed. Uh, the way really you have to get uh, essentially out into the community has changed drastically. And that's true for all major faiths. Uh, let me go to Imam Rami Ansur again, who's founding director of the Tabia Foundation, and ask you the question I asked before. Those who are struggling with their faith, what do you tell them, Imam? What do you say to them? Well, it's Yes, it's a very good question, and there are a lot of people struggling. And in the, the process of, of shifting to online, uh, the Friday sermons are now in many places being delivered online, and people are encouraged to pray at home. Uh, we're expecting Ramadan to be the same, where um, sermons and lectures, and even right now a lot of webinars are being given. Uh, and there's a lot of outreach into the community, and the, the, the fear and the anxiety or the, the trauma that's, that, that's being felt is at many different levels. So, for example, some are feeling it at the financial level, and so the 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 imams and the the organizations and the chaplains and so forth they're trying to mobilize to to address that with online fund ra- fundraisers connecting with other organizations because for many masjids um, especially coming up in Ramadan uh, 55 to 75 percent of their annual budgets come out of that month many of the of the smaller mosques their Friday donations are what keep the operation and their um, and their charitable works so with people losing their jobs not being able to pay rent now there's a bigger strain on the on the, the the mosques and they're ma- taking a lot of efforts to to reach out to the community so for some that it's that, that their their traumas is financial uh, we're trying to address that for some it is it's psychological and emotional whether it's because of pre-existing issues and everybody's got a has a different um, uh, experience with this uh, on the spiritual level for some it's it's theological and so we're responding to that the theological questions that are coming up is you know uh, is this a punishment from God what did we do to deserve that. So we're working, and I know this is uh, present in all faiths. For some, it's uh, psychological and emotional, whether pre-existing issues or uh, spurred by this. And so a lot of the Muslim mental health professionals, they're doing therapy online, they're doing classes. Then for some, it's, it's the, the healthcare workers, Muslim healthcare workers who are uh, make up a large percentage of healthcare workers in many areas. Um, they're at the front line. My sister-in-law is a nurse, and they have concerns. They're testing for uh, COVID-19. They're not giving them masks. Um, they have concerns. Uh, theological concerns of is this okay for me to do that? Um, you know, the healthcare workers are in some places the N95 masks. They don't have a proper fit with a beard. And for those Muslims and people of other faiths as well who who keep beards religiously, now the question is also coming up: Do I shave the beards? And I've um, given my advice on that that we have to we have to maintain safety. Um, and if that's the way to do it, um, then that's for the frontline providers. That's what they might have to do. There's burial concerns um, in the UK when they began speaking about cremation, uh, the Orthodox Jewish community and the Muslim community came together and they fought for their rights to say, we want to maintain our ability to uh, to perform our burials. They joined hands. They said, we're going to do it um, properly and safely. Um, and now the families might not have been able to attend the funerals, but they were able to get their life, last rites. So we're also seeing a lot of uh, faith-based communities coming together, people um, uh, working together um, uh, and looking at their common um, the, their common and beliefs and um, and seeing how they can work together uh, for this um, and it's so another sil- silver lining is that yes people are coming together they're looking at their humanity we realize this is not um, affecting just one community this is affecting humanity it's affecting people of all um, colors races socioeconomical status and so forth and then for for myself in my main line of work in dealing w- in working with the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated a lot of people in free society are now getting a little bit of a feeling of what it means to be deprived um, of, of freedom of, of the isolation and so forth um, and when we when we're also hearing from our uh, clients and students in prison that because the because of the the, the isolation it's making it even harder to do a lot of things. There's not a lot of health care that's already being provided in the prisons. Um, and so now we're getting stories from our students that are um, experiencing, um, have been diagnosed with corona, and they have their questions, and it makes it even harder to service them and their needs. Uh, but hopefully,
hopefully we're, we're all going to get through this, but it's really important that we pull together as humanity, um, regardless of a person's religious or spiritual beliefs, um, and, and see those commonalities that we have and work together to, whether it's at the charitable level, whether it's at helping people emotionally, whether it's checking in on family, whether it's reconnecting with family members, reaching out and connecting with people that maybe we haven't maintained as the, the, the connections that we need to, because those connections are really crucial for us to get through this. Let me get Raphael on. Raphael, welcome. Thanks for waiting. Good morning. I, I wanted to thank you for having everybody on this morning. I am a former prisoner, so I am good at, at quarantining. Um, but I, the, the imam and the pastor mentioned about prisons. What can we do to help the prisoners who are not going to get the help like the people here in free society? What can we do as the public to help them? A very important question. Let me go back, if I may, to you, Imam Rami Ansur, founding director of the Tabi Foundation. Uh, you've got a nonprofit going to teach incarcerated as well, right? Yes, we do. We offer uh, education, which includes Islamic education, as well as uh, rehabilitation and uh, addressing life skills education and assisting in uh, uh, getting higher, higher degrees of um, bachelor's, master's, and, and PhD, and so forth. And we also do reentry work um, uh, in a number of different areas, like actually across the U.S. in over 42 states. And we've reached over 7,000 individuals in over uh, 600 prisons. And in answer to the, the, to the questioner, there's a lot of things that we can do. One of the things that we're doing with our organization is writing letters to, as the pastor mentioned, you know, to advocate for the release of prisoners, especially those who are immunocompromised. Um, and today I'll be writing a letter for a person that I just got a um, uh, a request from him last year, uh, or last year he was supposed to be re released. He is immunocompromised, and they want to get him out released early. So we can, you can call on your your representatives and uh, the senators and try to say that some of these, uh, especially in California, that the CDCR, if they're going to be giving early release to prisoners, that they give priority to those who are immunocompromised and would be more susceptible to the COVID. Uh, but I think it's also a good time for us to go into do some introspection and ask ourselves, um, what are we doing to change the prison induction? industrial comp complex in, in the United States. Uh, many people don't know that the prisoners who are in medical facilities here in California, they don't have insurance. So housing them costs on average about half a million dollars a year. So that's half a million dollars a year of our taxpayer money that, and I'm not saying we, 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 re we, we need to give all of the medical attention to those prisoners, but we need to really start asking ourselves, where is our money being spent uh, and who is accountable for that? So we need to start advocating for that and or advocating for uh, um, changes in the prison in, in the prison uh, industrial complex. We don't have, the majority of people in prison are for uh, drug possession. I know one person who one of my good friends now spent over 20 years and had three life sentences for a um, uh, for a uh, possession of, of of drugs use. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of questions that we have to be asking ourselves. And this is a great time for introspection. You know, going back to one of the early que earlier questions about um, asking ourselves: Are we you know what is our belief in antiquated religious systems, and I think the, the, the question is, is warranted. We need to ask ourselves um, about um, maybe it's antiquated uh, interpretations of religious systems. Maybe it's misinterpretations of religious texts. We're seeing people of all faiths um, continuing to have gatherings, and in some of the large gatherings, they become hotspots of outbreak cases because they said, oh, we don't believe in the, the, the contagious nature of this and so forth. But at the same time, we should also be asking ourselves during this time of introspection and isolation isolation, you know, what are our antiquated understandings of cultures, of political systems, of economical systems, of attachment to, um, you know, cultures or antiquated understandings of immigration pop policies, and what is our xenophobia, and what have we done as human beings to possibly, um, you know, spending trillions of dollars on war, but not putting that money into our medical system, and um, per preventing future outbreaks or why why isn't trillions of dollars that are sp being spent on wars overseas why isn't that being spent on research and development for universal flu vaccines or other type of preventative me measures and then uh, why are we in a, as as the richest nation in the world why are we having a shortage of ventilators and why are we having a shortage of, of hospital beds so there, i think there's a lot of questions beyond just the um questioning the, you know, quote-unquote antiquated religious systems. Well, again, Imam Rami Ansur is founding director of the Tabia Foundation.